Do me a favor. I want you to put your hands together. I want to teach us just a simple little practice that we can use when life gets chaotic or hard or life gets loud as it has tonight. I was like, oh, the children are here. They're so loud. Okay, it's fine. <laughs> So sometimes we need to put our hands together. And I want, I try to teach Ben to do this, and he says, I don't think I can do it. But can you separate your fingers and go one, two, three, four, five. Try it. Thumb, finger, three, four, five. Okay, so with that, say stop, breathe, know your worth. Stop, breathe, know your worth. Stop breathe. Know your worth. So you can do this practice, not while you're driving, <laughs> but at work or at home or in the morning or when time gets frustrating or you've had it up to here, you can stop, breathe, and choose to know your worth. Thank you, guys. So I was the room, uh, in the room for two of my friends' children's birth as an extra supporter and as an observer in the room. And I watched as the needed pattern breathing of the mom with each contraction, right, as she was using her own source of life and breath in that moment to push out new life. And then that split second between that new baby breaking the surface out of the womb into life on this earth, there is a silence and a celebration in that moment, that quiet pause while the oxygen of our atmosphere gets breathed deeply into those tiny little lungs. And in that moment, the mom and the rest of us in the room, we are holding our breath until finally the exhale of wailing that ensues, signifying that that baby is finally Finally, fully here. And it's in those moments as if that baby just can't quite seem to contain all of their maybe excitement of their new capacity and the possibilities of life here. And then as their breath continues, as well as those cries, we realize that they are finally here. So I was there for first breaths, and it was peaceful and exciting. So I stop, I breathe, and I say, know your worth, little ones. I was also there for a last breath, too, as many of you have probably also experienced. Mine had me in another hospital room this time, but this time it was to tend to the last hours of my brother-in-law's 32-year-old life with many of my family and friends there, too. And I'll never forget those last minutes. There was a knowing in the atmosphere. Even after we'd all spent weeks in the hospital, in and out of the hospital, and months walking with him in chemo, we could sense in the air that day that it was finally time. And so we all were there, and we gathered in the room, and we waited, and we honored his life and these last moments. And he opened his eyes one last time and looked directly at my sister, who was at the foot of his bed, to, as if to say goodbye to his wife. Then he closed his eyes, and he breathed in one last time, and he breathed out. And I had to catch my breath in that moment to accept the reality of what was actually here, to stop, to breathe, and to know the worth of this life. Now, these moments matter deeply to me because I was very close with these people, right? That's why I was invited into these intimate spaces. But the magnitude of both of those moments helped me start to choose to pay attention to what else actually catches my breath in this life. And for me, it happens in lots of different ways with lots of different emotions surrounding it. So sometimes I'll catch my breath in the morning as I'm standing in the kitchen and I glance out the back window and there once again is a baby deer with his mom. It catches my breath in wonder and excitement. Other times I've caught my breath in a concert setting in the power and the energy of a stadium filled with fans and rapt attention to this entertainer who chooses to use her platform to speak truth against power. I caught my breath in that moment. I catch my breath sometimes in moments of watching my kids actually be kind to each other because it happens sometimes. We catch our breath in moments like this past weekend when we're scrolling through our phone or we're watching the news and we literally have to see the devastation of this hurricane and the flood. It takes our breath away for just a second. And I want to ask, why? Why? 
For me, I think it's we have this built-in response, this thing that is woven into the fabric and chemistry of our minds and our hearts so that in those moments, we can remember what actually matters. So we can remember that this life matters for all of us, that this world around us, that nature and creation and all of the creatures that inhabit it, all of it matters, and yet every day we often forget this truth. And so this idea of breathing can remind us. Breathing is something that we all share in common on this earth. It's something that we do both consciously and subconsciously. So sometimes we need to stop, breathe, and know the worth of this moment and all of those that are involved in it. So this breath can invite us back to the realization of our shared humanity, of our commonwealth, of the interconnectedness of all of us. And then also this breath can help us be connected with the pain and suffering of others in this world. So when you see something that causes you to stop and breathe, life is trying to speak to us. And so when we all saw that picture that Anna was just singing about, the picture of that Syrian boy washed up on the shore, something happened in us. When the reality of that picture hit us, it took our collective breath away. It caused us to pause. And for most of us, it caused us to care. And it caused us to choose to not look away any longer. For this boy was not a refugee in that moment. He was no longer just someone from another country. It didn't matter where he was going, right? It didn't matter in that moment what he believed in or didn't believe in. He was simply a boy, an innocent child. And it took our breath away because his chance at living and breathing was gone. And we saw it and we remembered that this should matter to us. He mattered to us because he is connected to us. He is one of us. Just like these kids and these sounds that we're hearing in this room, we are all connected. And in those moments, we remember that. See, I believe that we all have this innate value inside of us of empathy and compassion. But those things have often been silenced by our focus at times on simply maturing our knowledge and our intellect, but not also focusing on maturing our emotions and our hearts. These innate values in us have been silenced at times by our fears and they have led us to division. That has led us towards the us that is small and an exclusive us, not the inclusive, collective, and large broad us. And often this world is groaning, it is shouting, it is begging at us to remember our values and who we are. To remember that life is a gift for all of us to enjoy. And so my question is for all of us tonight is, does it take death on the shores of our oceans? Does it take hurricanes, hurricanes that cause floods on the lands of our nation? Or does it take rallies of tiki torches filled with darkness in order for us to stop and breathe for each other? I long for us once again to care without the heightened fear of fear or tragedy, right? To know that we are all gifted this same life and breathe this same precious air. To see also that the ones that are often hurting us are in pain themselves. The ones that are hurting us are themselves acting out of fear. And for us to choose to, instead of sit here and blame them, can we respond with love instead of more fear? My hope for us as individuals and as a community, as a Mary, as Imaginarian, would be that we would choose to put love into practice. Krista Tippett, the speaker from On Being, she says, what we practice, we become. So listen, we can create a better world first by becoming better ourselves, by becoming people of love and not fear, by constantly asking ourselves better questions than who is to blame, but instead, like civil rights activist Ruby Sales, let's ask, where does it hurt? Where does it hurt? But to do this and to live this, we must show up. We must show up first and challenge the hate and the normative ways of our culture because if left unchallenged, they will persist. So we will show up in love and in goodness. We also must show up and offer healing, restorative healing, to let the victims of violence and hate know that we care, know that we want to surround them with comfort and with protection. And in doing so, I think we will find strength inside of us. I think we will find strength in our diversity, power in our collaboration, 
we will find that this kind of broader community will spread the workload that needs to be done. It will increase our capacity and our impact. See, and I think people in this nation, in this world, they are looking to have confidence again in this kind of a community. Because we have confidence in a lot of things right now. We have confidence in anger. We have confidence in hate and fear. We have confidence in communities that are perpetuating those values because they are rampant here. So I say let's create something that the world can have confidence in that is good and that is love. And that is us. And so to do so, we're going to forge new relationships together. We're going to actually start talking to each other, not just get behind a computer screen or our phones on Facebook, right, and social media. We're going to have to show up face to face. And that means sometimes tensions are going to rise. Sometimes paradoxes are going to surface. And in those moments, I believe that we will find the brokenness of the world that longs to simply be held first. And then it can be healed. Everybody okay? Held and healed. He's okay. All right, so to be held and healed. See, the world is often unbalanced, right? The world is often unbalanced, and we can go easily then out of balance and out of focus with it, or we can choose to tip those scales. We can choose to lean in with all of our hearts, and so when hate rises up, I hope that the good can rise up in us in response, but this will be an intentional choice to stop, to breathe, to know the worth of the situation and all of those involved. So I read last year the, the idea of an imaginarium. It was referring to the space in all of our minds devoted to the imagination. Anna just talked about this. We're specifically using that idea of imaginarium though to create an imaginative space to create better ideas to push for healthier ways of living. So we have to first imagine that we deserve, all of us deserve a better world and then together live into this. So maybe this will be a space for you to stop, to breathe and to find yourself, to find your own worth because some of us are living in small confined places in our own minds because you think that's all you deserve. And so we hold ourselves back and we limit our love even towards ourselves. We question our worth and our impact and we question our purpose. So what we need is a living, breathing community to show up and to mirror our worth to us, to make us feel safe and make us feel accountable to our own capacity. We also need a space that's going to challenge our perceptions, right, and our biases, a safe space that will involve participation from all of us, from young to old, right? In these moments, we want participation from all of us, young to old, those of us from many different backgrounds and cultures. And so then we can take this space, this imaginarium, and formulate these better ideas and then live them out. For real change to happen, ideas need to be practiced. That's why the saying goes, the distance between our dreams and our current reality, reality is called action. It is called movement. And so that's why we're saying up on the screen that intention plus action equals pure magic. Because this movement is you and me saying that we won't settle for less than we all deserve. We will stop, we will breathe, and we will know our worth. And so I hope that we breathe in this moment and this night and this electricity of what is longing to be brought forth by you and me, something better for you and for me. But it's going to take your thoughts and mine. It's going to take your hands and mine. For the saying goes, we are the ones we've been waiting for. So we have within us this power and this intelligence and this empathy and this compassion. And we will make mistakes, yes, and we will grow from them, and we will pick each other up, and we will press on. So many of us find ourselves on the margins of society or even institutions because we've been forced there, or some of us have willingly walked out there. But on these margins is where the power lies to create change. On the margins, we can break down these barriers and these boundaries that are holding all of us back. Here on the edge is where we finally realize that there is no cliff to fall off of, that there is no threat, but instead, this is a place to launch us to new heights and to new places, to stop, to breathe, and to know our worth. I'm ready to live deeper. I'm ready to enjoy all this life wants to offer. I'm ready to work for you and with you for the betterment of all of us. 
because I want to do this with you. Anna and I want to do this with you. So this is an invitation to change the world. No small feat, but we can do it. You and I, one step, one act, one voice at a time. Let's let this world take our breath away for a moment and remember who we are and what we were capable of. And let's do good work. I'm ready. Are you? Thanks.